Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, especially at such an early hour. Uh, I'm Neil Graboy, uh, the dean of uh, Milano, and we have now a new, a new name, the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Public Policy. So we're using that name, uh, even though some of you know us exclusively as Milano. Uh, this is the second of these uh, eponymous dean's breakfasts. And uh, we're delighted uh, with uh, uh, our guest, uh, who uh, I've known for a few years uh, <laughs> since we were uh, college freshmen together uh, at Swarthmore College. Uh, and I, it, it was only a few years, is that right? Wasn't just, a few just a few years ago just, yes. uh, that, uh, that we were together. Uh, and Button Weezer's uh, bio is in, in your uh, program, and you will see from the program uh, just how many extraordinary things uh, that she has done. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, share with you some things about uh, her and her family, uh, because her family has a very rich history of involvement uh, with the New School. Uh, Anne's father, Isidore Lubin, uh, served in President Roosevelt's cabinet in fact, and uh, was an early trustee of the New School. Uh, and Anne and her husband Larry have both served on Milano's board. Uh, our paths have kind of intersected in ways that uh, I did not know, I'm sure Anne didn't, uh, and that she has been teaching at Columbia, I've taught at Columbia, she's associated with the New School, I'm associated with the New School, we were at Swarthmore together. So something was faded uh, that uh, Anne and I should be sitting in, in, in front of you. Uh, and, uh, actually, Anne and her husband have been very generous uh, to the New School, and in 1997, they endowed the Isidore Lupin Fellowship uh, to memorialize her father and support PhD students in the Urban Policy Program at Milano. And to date, there have been 14 uh, Lupin Fellows, and uh, I think there are four here uh, today. Uh, Elizabeth Ann Kukaro, uh, Megan Reese Gavin, Tom Jacobs and Jeanette Rausch. Jeanette is one of them? Well. Oh, fabulous. I didn't know that. <laughs> a pal of yours who has oh, your and fellowship how? and you didn't know it. Uh, oh, well, it's, it's great. Uh, so we're delighted to have uh, everybody here. Uh, these uh, coffees are really intended uh, to bring uh, important thinkers uh, to the new school, granted early in the morning so that everybody's free if you can uh, drag yourself out, and the quality of the people who are uh, involved in these breakfasts is such that, in fact, we are seeing some uh, really impressive people. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, I will introduce Anne by saying, here's Anne, uh, and uh, I think we'll have a film first, about how long? It's about a minutes? half an hour. About I'm half an hour. hour. I'm going to say a couple of words in that. And then uh, Anne will make some remarks. Uh, this is being taped, uh, consequently, uh, in the question and answer period after Anne's remarks. Uh, I think you're supposed to go up to that microphone uh, so that the tape will be available uh, to others uh, to enjoy what we're enjoying in person. So with that, uh, Anne Buttonweiser, we're delighted to have you. And uh, I've only seen her once in a few years uh, at a reunion <laughs> of some distinction. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Anne Button Weasel with us. Well, I'm delighted to be here, Neil. And um, I'm particularly delighted to talk about my most favorite subject and my fifth child. Um, I'm going to start with a parable that I found online recently, and it is just so fitting for this subject. And excuse me if I read it. Uh, in the year 2011, the Lord came to Noah, who uh, sorry, was now living in Australia and said, once again, the earth has become wicked and overpopulated, and I see the end of all flesh before me. Build another ark and save two of every living thing along with a few good humans. He gave Noah the blueprints, saying, you have six months to build the ark before I will start sending a uh, sorry, sending rain in Queensland for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Um, six months later, the Lord looked down and saw Noah sweeping his yard, weeping in his yard, but there was no ark. Noah, he roared. Um, I've started the rain in Queensland. Where is the ark? Forgive me, Lord, and beg Noah, but things have changed. I need a building permit. <laughs> <laughs> I've been arguing with the boat inspector about the need for an onboard sprinkler system. My neighbors claim that I violated the neighborhood bylaws by building the ark in my backyard. Then the local council and the electricity company demanded a shed load of money uh, to uh, cover the costs of laying power lines. Um, the, uh, what should we have here? The uh, trade unions say, I can't use my sons. They, <laughs> uh, I have to have only union workers with arc building experience. Immigrants are checking the visas, uh, immigration is checking the visa status of my workers. And he goes on with the assorted environmental and animal rights constraints. So forgive me, I said, but uh, that it will take at least, Noah said, it will take at least 10 years for me to build the ark. I started the pool, it took me 27 years. <coughs> Um, suddenly, the uh, skies cleared over clean Queensland, the sun began to shine, and a rainbow stretched across the sky. Noah looked up and w in wonder and asked, you mean you're not going to destroy the world? No, said the Lord. The Australian government beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of a lecture today, I've got a, a video, sh video to show you. Uh, uh, that will probably stimulate a more useful discussion afterwards. I believe the process of cr creating the floating pool is very pertinent to students and faculty alike here. Uh, as I know many of you work in or are interested in public service and government and not-for-profits. This project was created and managed by a not-for-profit and we worked with every imaginable, imaginable city and state agency, and we had many of the same problems that Noah had with his ark. So can somebody put this thing in for me? Basically, in the preliminary stage, when we first heard about it, we thought it was a joke. Uh, it was like a floating swimming pool. I mean, here in South Louisiana, I mean, anywhere that's water, you can pretty much swim, you know, so. Yeah, Bollinger's been in existence for 60 years this year, and we've built over a thousand vessels for the marine industry, and repaired and converted tens of thousands of vessels in our history. This floating pool project is probably one of the most unique projects we've ever tackled. There's something that's very appealing to me about taking on projects that just seem too difficult to do, um, too unrealistic. My name is Ann Buttonweiser. I am the founder and the president of the Neptune Foundation, which I created to build a floating swimming pool for the city of New York. Well, this is a big problem. Uh, the diagonals are not exactly equal, and this might present a big problem when it comes to laying out our pavement pattern. So we've got to confront the yard at probably this afternoon. We'll say 39, 3902, 3906. 3906, that's a half inch difference. We need to be relatively right on 
at least in terms of things being square. Yeah, and, as, and, as you and I imagine, uh, they're, they're pretty close on a lot of it, but they're, they twisted it and there's not, they're not exactly square sitting on the top. So I want to see how bad this is going to be. I would recommend whatever papers you try to cut it to fit. I mean, as far as this quarter inch plate, yeah. I mean, if you try to cut this loose, you know, you, you ain't got, I mean, it's, you won't have nothing left. It's going to warp it. Can we live with it in one or two cases? Yeah, I think so. If it's right on, if it's right on a line between the eight inches and the two foot four, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a little uh, coronary. I mean, that's a, this has been an extraordinarily way. difficult project. We've it it has involved changing whether it was going to be cement or a brand new steel barge or a. Uh, used barge. We went for the used barge. We have had um, delays that are just uncountable, uh, mainly due to Hurricane Katrina. Effects of Katrina on our facilities, on our workforce, were extremely tough in the middle of this conversion project. Uh, we lost a tremendous number of our employees, many of whom didn't return. Any project that you're doing for the public sector, funded through a variety of uh, charities and private donors, uh, it takes a while to put together. The, the money raising was one issue. We also have had de delays just because the design is very complicated. It's never been done before. So in this particular case, Anne found an architect, I mean, seven years later, uh, I can't say this is a lucrative project. Uh, there's no way I've been in it for the money. I had carte blanche to do what I wanted to do as long as I could meet the budget. So for me, this is, this is why I'm an architect, to, to take on projects like this. These are, in, in maritime construction, these are called stiffeners. These are uh, welded angles uh, that are stitch welded to the side of plate. This whole wall will be covered with a series of, of uh, dyed cement board strips. And there'll be a set of lockers on each side of this wall with a little bench in between. And in each one of these little locker niches, we have a skylight. It won't have any glass over it. And light should be able to bounce around and dribble in. And these will be a series of kind of childlike houses that kids get to change in and play in before they go down to the pool itself. Uh, about a year from now, this whole area is going to be filled with screaming kids doing cannonballs into a four foot deep pool. It's 25 meters long, 50 feet wide, there'll be seven lanes. And this will be filled with lounge chairs. Uh, folks will be relaxing, looking out over the East River. We are planning to open the pool to the public in 2007, Memorial Day, and uh, as of now, we're on schedule. I have days when I am so discouraged I wanted to, as I say, throw the baby out with the bathwater, but uh, this is a fabulous project and it's something that I have wanted to do now for 26 years, and we are going to do it. I'm a historian of New York City, and I found this floating pool or was floating bath uh, in doing research for a history. I believe that that context is very, very important in what we're doing today. This isn't just a modern, gorgeous pool that's being brought to New York City. This is a piece of New York City that we are recreating in a way. It's not exactly what we had because the old ones you actually swam in the river, but uh, the history is very important. It's very important for the children who use this facility to know that in fact these once existed in the 19th century here in New York. This is Castle Clinton and these are the very earliest floating baths.
The original ones were, there were two of them down at the battery. They were privately run by two dentists and they were used to bring people to refresh themselves in the sea, the salt air. It was supposed to make them healthier. And believe it or not, there were once 15 floating baths, as they were then called in the city, and they were placed outside of the tenement districts. There was a, a, an Irish bath, and there was a German bath, and there was an Italian bath, and they didn't mix. These were actual pools that were on uh, sort of pontoon structures that had dressing rooms, and um, in the center, in the early days, they had river water in them. At their high point, ironically, they were closed down because the health department discovered by placing um, dye, red dye, in a, uh, one of the sewers in the Lower East Side, it ended up down at the battery in one of the pools. They closed up the bottoms of the pools and uh, did reopen them within a year, but there were only five that were retrofitted and reopened. The last floating pool was closed in 1935. There were three of them that Robert Moses kept when he was building the West Side Highway. The community over there had been closed off from going to the river, and um, he put three of the baths together and um, created a, a club for the people who read the residents of the Upper West Side. I spoke with him before he died, and I said, how come you didn't keep them? He said, I got money to build in-ground pools. We didn't need them anymore. By the fall of 2006, our shape roofs were painted, the fixtures were in. It really started to look like the project that we designed, and I was very, very excited about it. The idea of floating a building or floating a project up to New York and having um, a piece of architecture enter the harbor of New York City after a trip from down south. As an architect, my buildings stay still. And this was the first opportunity I had to um, make architecture that moved. <laughs> When the barge arrived in New York, it was late and we had been waiting for it all afternoon. I, I jumped up and down and screamed. I said, there it is, there she is, there she is, she's here. And, and everyone said, how do you know that's her? And I couldn't miss it because I knew what the structures were and what they looked like. And furthermore, you could actually see the pool from where we were standing. And it had water in it from the Gulf. you to conform to New York City code or any code. I'm asking you the question of will there be sewer gas? This is a unique job for us because it's it's on a a barge, a, a ship, and we don't we I I've never had to do plumbing on a on a ship and that shouldn't make it that much different, but it, it, it does. It's unique. We've done buildings over water, we've worked on the buildings and the problems related to this are very interesting. The, the need is to first satisfy somebody sure. that you're not going to get so gas or you can get so gas. 
the other part. What a unique, uh, listen, it's absolutely beautiful. We're in lower New York Bay. We're looking across at the Manhattan skyline. Uh, you got a swimming pool. You're, you're on the water. You got the city on one side. The, the juxtaposition is absolutely tremendous. I like it. Great idea. Oh, it's like nothing I've ever worked on before. Uh, I can't think of anyone who said, oh yeah, I, I know all about that type of thing, I'll help you out. Everyone's like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. Concept of the boat, a pool on, on water is, is strange. <laughs> Very strange, you know? It's, well, it's the first I ever really see, so I kind of like it. Before I thought about it, I didn't really see the sense of it, but now to really see everything else that it's really doing, you know, I think it's fun. As long as they steady the boats, I think it's going to be great. I would guess they're going to stationize, stationize this at some point. Now, when you said they're going to move it to different areas. Are they going to? Yes, where kids don't have pools and stuff like that. Are they? Yeah, that's what he was saying just now. Yeah, make sure it's steady and anchored real good. Steady and anchored real good? Yeah. It should be fun. What happens if they don't? Well, you get a little... Uh, we a see little maybe a little bit sometimes, but... Sick, but but when you have fun, I don't think it will make much of a difference, you know. You guys, uh, has it gotten rough enough out here where you felt a little queasy? Uh, maybe Monday, yeah. Tuesday. Early morning when there's a lot of traffic on the water, you know, like the ferries going back and forth and all the other ships. It's a good concept. I like the concept. And plus it's good for kids, you know, who don't have pools in their area and stuff like that. That's cool. Keep them out of the street, keep them out of trouble. All for it. So we finally bring it to New York. All you've got to do is add water. It's a pool. It'll happen. Uh, as it turns out, though, a whole bunch of regulatory agency approvals were necessary. Construction issues were way behind schedule, and we still didn't have a site as to where to put the pool or whether we were going to even open it in summer 2007. The questions were, people are going to jump over, people are going to fall off the gangways, uh, people are going to drown in four feet of water, uh, they're going to slip and they're going to break their legs. Well, it's a pretty unorthodox use of a barge, and so it generally produces a bit of chuckling when I speak to underwriters about it. Nobody wanted to give us insurance this summer because nobody had ever figured out of that there could be a pool on a barge. The Neptune Foundation was fined $20,000 by the State Department of Environmental Conservation. They are in charge of things that are in the water, in New York State waters. This was very frustrating, very frustrating f for us. We didn't quite know what we could do to convince them that this was a, the beginning of opening up New York City's waterfront to recreation. There's one other project which I'm going to be starting very shortly, which is a book about this whole process. I think it's a very good learning experience for other people, and it's going to be called No Good Deed Goes Unpunished. Years ago, when I had the idea of doing a floating pool, I would go to meetings with city officials, with community groups, and they would say, oh, here's the floating pool lady. And it came time to name it, and Jonathan said, oh, Ann, you just have to call it the floating pool lady. So that's how it got named. In the process of redesigning the barge, we were a little saddened to have lost the history of, of it being a cargo barge. And what we've been able to do is literally to drop the surface of that cargo barge. And you can see as we walk, remnants, uh, reminders of its variety of voyages. When it's filled, it's almost a magnifying glass. The water magnifies this, this history.
the next summer after we'd brought it up from Louisiana, we still had no site uh, and no real commitment until Empire State Development Corporation gave Anna a call and said, we want to do it and we want to do it in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Brooklyn Bridge Park is going to be the largest new development of a park in New York City in this century. One of the concerns is, since it's a long-range project, how do we get people into the park for the summer? It's really that sense of government stepping up and saying, let's do it. And my experience has been, for my 15 years on this site is, you know, we come up with a great idea, you know, the community, let's do this. And, whoa, whoa, oh no, 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 that's scary. That's, oh no, 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 oh, there's liability and insurance and what do the police say and, oh, oh no, political problems. We have the backing of the governor, the backing of everyone who's involved in this process. And the, the uh, role I took is I was told, make it happen. Oh my God, holy shit, we really, they said yes, let's do it. And they said, make it happen. And then, you know, who, me? Twenty-six years ago, I saw a drawing of children swimming in these funny structures, and I really had no idea of what this was going to be, and furthermore, I had no idea of what it was going to entail to make it be. There's been a lot of water over the dam, and we're still not there. I'm supposed to sign the license agreement today. Contractors go on the site tomorrow. Um, we've got less than a month, but we're going to get it done. I simply had to say, yes, I'm going to get this done by July 4th. I had absolutely no idea how I was going to do it. Everything's coming together very, very quickly. This is what we uh, call a charrette. It's all out, deadline, and um, it has to get done by July 4th. We've got all the electeds, that's what they're called. The electeds are coming on July 3rd to cut the ribbon. Lighting fixtures are being installed now, and uh, the raised concrete deck is being finished. It was crazy. <laughs> Everybody was scurrying around. People were, were you know, very polite to each other, but there was a lot of yelling, you know, get this done, come on, you know, you've forgotten to put this in. Uh, no, seriously, I, we sent this drawing. How can they decide to put the floor on, on one? Mm -hmm. The final phase of the, um, of the pavilions up here is what we call the cladding phase. We're cladding all of the little buildings that we've made with concrete board. But what happens if, if we're ready to, we want to open on the 4th, they do their walkthrough on the 3rd and they find four or five things that need to be corrected? They better be corrected in a hurry because they have to sign the back of the permit to operate. It's been a lo it's been a long haul. I have to say that I feel a sense of gratification. It, I ultimately think it's it's luck. We architects are, are huge fakers. We have absolutely no idea what it's going to feel like, whether the scale is correct, whether the various pieces work together, whether it has a coherence, whether it, it, it sings, whether it feels good. I'd seen a model, but that doesn't really mean too much. And the, the day that I came to the opening, and it was so gorgeous. I mean, anybody who saw that pool commented on the architecture. It was so beautifully done. By, by the time 
the last day arrived, uh, we were depending on a DOH approval. Once the barge was finished, we had to get approval from the Department of Health. So that was an amazingly anxious moment for us, although I, I must say I kept it uh, to myself as much as possible because I didn't want to freak the rest of the people out uh, who were depending on opening it. I've been here, we've been here all week, so we've seen this place go from no tiled floors to something, and all week we've been saying, I don't know. Are you ready, kids? I have to say that. Uh, it's what a great day this is. Who could believe this day has come? It takes people of extraordinary vision to get things done, and I want to just be sure that we salute the vision and the tenacity of Ann Buttonweiser for envisioning a waterfront that would bring people back and take away the commerce that has dominated it for 400 years, ever since the Dutch set up shop here. Brooklyn is famous for its bridges, and this project represents one of the best kinds of bridges there is, a bridge between the public and private sector, creating a partnership that gets things done for the betterment of all. Standing with me is Ann Buttonweiser, the president of the Neptune Foundation. Yay! And the woman whose 20 year vision has bound us all together. And it will come back. We hope it will come back to other parks. For instance, Barreto Point Park in the South Bronx. And the South Bronx has no swimming pools. We hope it wasn't pool. until an hour and a half before we opened to the public that we got a final OK from the Department of Health. We want a road test this year. If it works in Brooklyn, it can work for the road. They relented and said, yes, you've met the requirements. Let them on. An hour later, the place was packed and the uh, kids were in the pool. And then finally, the beautiful moment of seeing colored shirts on kids sitting up on the stadium steps uh, and the folks jumping in the water was just, it was delightful. Well, normally it takes nine months to gestate and give birth to a baby. My baby took 27 years and here it is, hooray. It would be wonderful if another city took this on and decided that they would like to have one. It's an idea that can be done inexpensively, much more inexpensively than building an in-ground pool. Our hope, though, is that this could be a model for how you provide swimming pools for underserved communities where it's, there isn't the space to build a new pool or there isn't the resources. This is a great solution. The city's got hundreds of miles of waterfronts and we're hoping to bring it to the South Bronx next year. We're working with this city DEP to get some connections for that and get a pier rebuilt. And whether any more of these could take place, it is, it's an unknown now. As far as New York is concerned, that really depends on the how the city and the state work together on developing the, the, the waterfront, the rest of the waterfront. Looking back on all of this, I'm very glad that I persisted. We had 50,000 people use the pool. A crazy idea, but well worth doing. The best moment was seeing the looks on the faces in the pool. And there was an amazement that here was a something that was free and this was an opportunity for people to be happy and to enjoy themselves and I wouldn't give that up for a moment. Finally the summer's over is big success tremendous amount of satisfaction from my end. 
But when I had to watch the pool leave uh, our berth on Brooklyn Bridge Park and go off to its winter home in Bayonne, I really felt a uh, kind of loss for a while until I got back to uh, projects that had been neglected for some time because that one was so much fun to work on. The best thing that could happen is that our waterways got cleaned up and we got rid of the combined sewer outlets. And then th we could do this very simply. You wouldn't have to have a large barge. You could have something that is just big enough to hold the dressing rooms and, 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 and a safe opening with a bottom and you could swim in river water. That's my ideal. A real return to the old. Yes. Uh, welcome to uh, Barreto Point Park. The seven lane, 25 meter long pool is the brainchild of Ann Buttonweiser, who is also with us today, looking very elegant. The barge, the way we heard about the barge, is that we saw it open up in Brooklyn. And we saw, yeah, we saw uh, relatively the same type of festivities that you see here out in Brooklyn. Now, I won't say that we're, we were jealous, no. we were envious. And that's a good envy. <laughs> this will bring people down to the waterfront and make them advocate for change. It's a political, it's a political idea. We're, we're planting the seeds for a little political revolution. Resistance against the forces that have created uh, the lack of opportunity, the lack of access, polluted waters. This is, the reason why this barge is so important is because it's, it, it, it lends um, to this notion that here in the Bronx, we have to change our spirit. It, it, it confirms that while we've had many decades of struggle, that the people of the Bronx, the children of the Bronx, deserve the very best like any other community. This barge is absolutely beautiful. This barge is state of the art. And more so than the, the everyday swimming that's gonna go on here, what's gonna happen is that our kids are gonna have this sense of change of spirit about who they are as Bronxites, what is expected of them. And when we change that spirit, we can change anything.
A video game will, it won't help you get to school. Project. Unfortunately, you have to be heroic to make something like this happen. Uh, you're going to have some remarks uh, for no, us? No, I, I or you think just want to take questions about questions uh, how we put together the next part. <laughs> well, I guess, guess the remark I do have is yesterday I met with the head of the Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, I don't know what it's now called, Development Corporation. And we are talking about Pool 2 for Brooklyn. Fantastic. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be another seven years, but... Can we ask, how, what does it cost to put together a, well, a pool like Well, this was... This? If you don't talk about the insurance and the barge stuff, it would be $5 million. Um, but it was way above that because the insurance costs were horrendous and the towing it from you know the south and then the state required us to move it out of New York State that's that was the twenty thousand dollar fine um, and along with that they said that it had to could after the 15th of September it could no longer be in the state of New York because it might be killing fish its shadow um, I mean, those of you who are working on water, these are some of the issues that, that one confronts. Uh, the, curiously, there have been studies that a barge, a, the footprint of, of a barge our size is something that the fish really love because they can scurry under it and get protected. But the state does not want to hear that. So, the, the, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Does evidence ever count? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> you want to go live? Yes, because uh, you, we, we need to have you uh, forever in print. In that case, I'll edit what I was going to say. Um, no. thank, you, thank you very much. I think it's a really fantastic project, and I swam in your pool in 2007 mm -hmm. when it was in the Brooklyn Bridge Park, so I uh, shared some of that excitement of jumping off the sides. So I appreciate that from myself and my family. Um, my question is more about how this pool connects to the larger issue of access to swimming for kids in New York City. Because I was involved in a group last year that fought to stay, keep the Double D pool, which is in Broom Hill in Brooklyn, open. So at a time when cities are not having funding to keep existing landlocked pools available, does, does your project help encourage more swimming access, or does it provide an alternative for the city to say, you know, we can do another way? Um, it's the former. Uh, the whole, uh, we had a learn to swim program the first summer that was not, not, I think, I don't know whether there was one in Brooklyn, but the first summer in, in the Bronx, which where you really needed it, mm -hmm. we had a learn to swim program. The Parks Department now owns the pool and they ran the program. The second year, the commissioner called me and said, we, we don't have any money. And I was able to raise the mm -hmm. small amount that was needed to get the learn to swim program there. Now, the commissioner has a program which he is going to be announcing shortly. Uh, a learn to swim program, he wants every uh, second grader in New York City to learn to swim. And that's so that, and he has figured out all of the different facilities, including the one you're talking about, yeah. to be able to open those and have those accessible to have this program. And the pool will be one of the uh, sites. Great, thank you very much. So I've broken the ice, come to the front. <laughs> <laughs> 
Does a project like this, as you look back on it, require one person with extraordinary motivation to make it come into reality? Or is it possible for government ever to do such a thing? <laughs> well, government did do it. Um, I think one of the things, the reason that I think I was successful is that I had worked for the city um, since I graduated from planning school. And um, I knew where the bodies were. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, somebody who really was, just did not know New York City, did not know the water and all of these, these issues, and I had written about this, uh, I think would have had a much harder time. But in, in the end, it was the state that came through and said, hey, you're here. Uh, you've been building it in our park, which was not, you know, not, which was nothing at the time. Let's keep you. And uh, it was, you know, if they hadn't said yes. And then, uh, when I, actually when I started this, before, way before I had even built it, I went to Commissioner Stern, who was then uh, head of the Parks Department and said, Henry, I'm, I'm going to build a floating pool. Would you, would you take it? He said, well, as long as you raise the money to run it. And Neptune was not created for that. We were created to build three prototype floating pools. That was it. We're not in the management business. And in fact, when it was in Brooklyn, we did not manage it. The Conservancy managed it. And um, so then um, years went by and the thing hadn't gotten built. And at that point, I was beginning to, next, I was beginning to start building it. And I went to Commissioner Benepe and I said, hey, we're, we're going to have a pool up here. We can get it here by 206. And um, would you take it? And he said, yes, I will. But by the time we had it finished, um, he did not have, was not prepared enough to run it that summer to accept it. So, and then we had to get the DEC permits for the Parks Department to be allowed to have it. And they now have a permit for 12 years, renewable every three years. So at the moment, they're, talk, they're trying to get it renewed for Barreto Point Park for another three years at least. And um, so, you know, there is a will. Where the, and I don't think, yes, maybe because, yes, because I knew these people that helped. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stephanie. Um, I just have a question about your title as urban planner. Uh, Eugene Lang just opened a new program, urban planning, here at the new school. And most of the attendants here are urban from an urban policy school. And I wanted to hear more about how the title of urban planner has changed over the last you know, 20 years. I know it's a growing field. You know, there's certifications and all that kind of stuff now. And um, how how do you relate to that title? Because I know that you're also an, an architect as well. Is no, that no, right? I mean, no, I have, I have a degree in urban planning. Okay, could you talk more about that and also about the financing package of the pool? Okay, the I can't talk too much about urban planning because I never got certified. I worked in city planning. I, my specialty became the waterfront because that's what I wrote my dissertation on. Mm -hmm. And um, so that I, I just used that knowledge to work as a planner. Uh, basically, in those days, the city knew nothing about what could happen on the waterfront. So I was the, quote, expert who was able to travel around and bring back the knowledge from other cities for New York to start doing things. And then I was hired to work on the uh, West Side uh, Highway replacement after uh, most of you, are, all of you were too young to know about Westway, but this was a large... Um, <laughs> there are a few of us. We're not supposed to confess, but we're, we're here. Westway will never be built. That's the button. That was the button. That was the button. And I was, uh, at first I was on a, a committee that the governor set up to, to create the parks part of Westway. They were, they were going to fill in over the piers on the west side and create a highway underground with parks and development. And um, it, the, the development was just unknown and scared an awful lot of people. And it was fought and, and it was killed. The, and and it was, they used a, uh, they was gonna kill the, the striped bass, the spawning grounds of the striped bass. So they used an environmental 
uh, regulation to kill the project. So p after that, the governor and the, and the uh, mayor set up a committee to decide what to do post-Westway. And we came up with the plan that you now have on the west side, the, the continuous park that goes from, at the moment, 72nd Street down to the Battery. So. Great, thank so. you. And about the financing of Oh, the financing, oh. okay. I created the Neptune Foundation 501c3 in order to raise money. I was extraordinarily lucky because I had, be, I had a long time friend, a much older woman who had quite a bit of money, and she died and she left me a million dollars, or left Neptune a million dollars. So that started it. It was a lot easier to raise four million dollars. And um, most of the money, except for a, uh, a donation from the Kaplan Foundation, all it was, it was all private. There was no, no public money put into it, but of course now the public is running it and the Parks Department pays for everything. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Gavin. I'm a PhD student here. Um, so I just first just want to thank you for your contribution to us students and also to the new school um, in addition to what you've done for New York City. Um, I think my question is a fun question. Um, I know for myself, being able to kind of self-reflect on different work that I've done, um, sometimes I say to myself, oh, if I could do it again, this is how I would do it. So I'm curious if, now that you're away from your success a little bit, if you have reflected and maybe some of the things that we saw, you think, wow, if I could do it again, this is what I've learned, this is how I would do it a little bit differently. I'm sure, you know, you don't have to, maybe just some of the big, big pieces. Big, big issues. Well, I mean, the biggest issue was the DEC, a state DEC, and we went to them way before we started to build this. And I think I went with people from the Parks Department and um, wanted to know, at that time, they were turning down any barge structure, anything that would be built on a barge. And their big fear was they were gonna build waste treatment, people would build waste treatment plants on barges and that there would be a whole new layer around the city of these barges with, which, with things that were needed. Things may not be needed, you know, a helicopter land, uh, landing. In fact, if you look down at the helicopter place down at the lower, at the bottom of Manhattan, that's all on barges. And they were, can you imagine, I mean, just sort of a futuristic view of Manhattan with all of this stuff sticking out to it, some good, some bad. I was coming with a recreation, and to me that was motherhood. And somehow different, and I can't justify that, different from a waste treatment plant or an electricity plant. I mean, the city needs all of these things, but um, so that's, that was, anyway, I came out of that meeting and they didn't say no. And that was the first time. They had said no to everything up until then. But they didn't say yes. And yes, if I had it in the future, how could I do it? Work with the DEC more and more and more, but that, that's not the answer because we got a new director for the, the local DEC who was even more uh, conservative than the people I had met with earlier. And these things change. You don't know who's going to be in office, so I can't say that I would do anything different. I know where the pitfalls are, which I didn't know at the time. Hi, thank you, that was very nice. Um, my name is Bob Buckley and I'm here at the New School. I guess I have an, an interpretation that may be wrong and I'd like you to comment on and a question that's related to it. And my interpretation is that this wouldn't have happened unless you made this bet, that you were betting that it was a good idea and that ultimately they would agree with it and that you put the resources there to, in effect, make a bet. And so that's, that's a much larger question about how things change and those types of bets and what do you think of that? And then secondly, did you ever get to the point where you thought you lost the bet, where you thought it was, uh, they're just gonna stop me, the way your uh, uh, pr yes. prologue suggested? Um, two weeks before it was supposed to open, 
we had been working with the state, state Empire State Development Corporation, to get the permit from DEC to open the pool. And I had been told, stay out of it, we're going to deal with it. And they knew from day one that this was going to, this was the make or break. The state knew this. And they, we, we admitted this, we all knew this. So two weeks before, I got a call from Avi Schick, who's a, you probably many of them, he's now head of the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. He was head of the uh, Governor's Island for a while. He's a very uh, well-placed state official. Um, saying, well, we've, we've solved the problem and the state is going to uh, levy a $50,000 fine, two weeks before we're going to open. And I said, and who's going to pay that? And he, because I had said from the very beginning, you know, if this is going to be, you're going to deal with this, you're going to pay for it or else we're going to share this cost. And he said, you are. At which point I hung up the phone and burst into tears. <laughs> and you know, that was that was it was it. That was it. So I have a board and I called my board and said, um, this is what they're saying, and they said, You can't open it. We're not gonna you cannot use the our money to do this. So we negotiated and got it down to twenty thousand dollars. And I went back to my board and said, Well, it's now twenty thousand dollars, I'm going to pay it. And they said, No, you're not. And I said, we have to open this. I said, we've got to show that this is a success, and we've got to get this, the constituency out there for it. And once that's happened, there's no turning back. And they said, OK. So that's your answer. Making a bet <laughs> again. And I want to tell you all that she was instrumental in the very, very beginning of all of this. <laughs> So good to see you again. Jeanette Rausch, a PhD student in Milano. Um, I was just curious, you know, when you hear about Robert Moses opening a pool every week with the mayor there, you know, back in the 1930s, um, if you think like administration, like if there was administrative change that really, you know, and in some ways Bloomberg has changed a lot of the, the uh, proceed the thinking about recreation and art, the arts and such, though a lot of it relies on private support, not just public support. Um, so I was wondering how, how you thought the leadership sort of in that, in that manner. Um, and then my other question, uh, which I completely forgot now, <laughs> so maybe if you answer the first question. <laughs> You're not asking if we want another Robert Moses. Well, you know, the first half of Robert Moses' life was great the things he did for the city. It was the second half where he got too full of himself, is my belief. But. Well, the class I teach at Columbia, I, I, the first thing they have to do is read um, Jane Jacobs. Jane. And then at the ha second half of the semester, they read Robert uh, Moses. And the, the assignment is that they must follow a project that is in the works, whether it's a, you know, a new hotel or whether it's something on the waterfront, whatever it is. and they. I ask them, and they, they need to find out all of the, the cast of characters and what are the problems, and at the end of their searching through this, I said, you know, where do you come out, on Jane Jacobs' side or on Robert Moses? They all want a czar. <laughs> well, part of, part of that is planning. Planning is easily as done if there is a czar. If you have, but my actually dissertation is on public participation in urban land use development, so I'm not you know, <laughs> proposing that. Um, but my second question was state DC. And I think in the 1970s, all these environmental acts came in and people thought that was a great success. And now um, I know there's committees um, working on should we even continue having environmental impact studies? Are they just being used as ways for the public to stall good projects? Are they providing any environmental benefits? And we had some of the same experiences uh, with the Harlem River piers where we had to put an extra 400,000 to just put piers in the water for the fish. You know, that's taxpayers' money. And so I'm just curious if you think, you know, what you think about sort of the whole environmental legal system for the federal government, you know, down, really having to be rethought, especially well, in this global The thing that has always climate. bothered me the, the most was using the environment as, as a, something to stop yeah. projects. And certainly they've been, the uh, 
uh, what is it, historic preservation laws have been used in the same way. And that's not what they were set out to do. Um, the, the question is how can you change things around for just using the floating pool to say, okay, a recreational facility is okay, but that's not going to open the door for your heliport or your waste treatment plant or that. And that that's where you get <coughs> it's a sticky, sticky wicket. Thank you. And of course, they give the same uh, argument for a four foot overhang for a pedestrian. Oh, yes. That was you know, <laughs> walkway around on the waterfront as, yeah. you know, a pool. So. Well, we, we need the studies to, to prove that the fish, in fact, like these things. And, and maybe they will come out and say, no, they don't, in which case, okay, now we have to think about another way to do it. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Blaise Rasta. I run a program called the Community Development Finance Lab at Milano. And first of all, I just, your poise and tenacity are like infectious. It's really, <laughs> it's like. You're going back to New Orleans, huh? Yeah. Well, I, just, I actually just got back last night from New Orleans. And so I have two questions. The first is, I want to make sure I heard you correctly in terms of cost from both a capital and an operating side of the coin that a barge is cheaper to build and cheaper to operate than the current pools in the system or not? No, the answer is cheaper to build, yes, because if, if you build it on land, first of all, you've got to get the land. Uh -huh. And, and uh, at the time when we started this, uh, they were the cost for redoing, what is that big pool? McCarran. In McCarran was $8 million mm -hmm. versus maintaining something that is in ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to paint it, all the kinds of things that you would do every, every year you do here. Mm -hmm. But there's also the wear and tear of it being in the water. And those are sort of unknowns at the moment. OK. And my second question is relating to to Neil's comment is um, have, you know, my first thought, I, my head is always thinking <laughs> crazy thoughts, um, but was that, you know, you built it in Louisiana and um, there's, you know, the same kind of access issues uh, to recreation um, that you have here in the city in New Orleans. Um, and you also have a lot of waterfront in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So has anybody asked you about, you know, looking at the feasibility, it's a lot less of a distance to Guess what? move from one spot to the other. Guess what? When, when we finished the pool and we still didn't quite know where we were going to go in New York mm -hmm. and Katrina had happened, I offered it to the mayor. Okay. They couldn't get their act together. Well, I, that's, that's <laughs> def definitely, the, definitely, but nobody, nobody has, has expressed any interest to you since that time. No, not since that time. Okay. Great. I'd like to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> That's some interest. I'm Carol Anderson. I'm the Director of Career Development and Placement. So I have an observation and then a question. The observation is it's been very interesting to hear you relay how your previous time learning the ins and outs of the city and your previous career in the city were leveraged in a way that you may not have thought of at the time you were a city employee. I spend a lot of my time trying to push horizons open and say the trajectory is not a ladder and it's not neat. So I think what you did, what you've done, is a great example of how you never know where you're going from where you are, but get on there and go anyway. Absolutely. Terrific. And my question is, since I live west of the Hudson, what is so different about the water in the Hudson that New York said no and Bayonne said come? And will you build one in New Jersey? <laughs> All right, I have a story about that as well. <laughs> The first place it was supposed to go was Hoboken. And again, we were just starting to, Jonathan and I were working on, you know, figuring out how to design it. And um, a friend of mine um, invited, had, oh, he was a lawyer, he is a lawyer over there. And he said, oh, he had worked on the Port Authority piers in Hoboken, which was then Port Authority. And so he was really knew those piers. And he said, let's get it to. Hoboken. So we met with the mayor who was all for it. We, we even had the uh, people who were designing, the architects here in New York who were designing one of those recreation piers even had cut out a niche in the design for the pool to sort of nestle in there and just stay. And then the mayor got ousted for some yes. something. So we lost him 
And then the next person that came in was not really interested in him. But then I just found out that his head of planning was somebody that I also knew. So I called her and I said, well, you know, can we revive this? And they dragged their heels and dragged their heels. And at that point, Adrian Benepe said, I'll take it. And I called him and I said, I'm terribly sorry. It's going to New York. Can you talk a little bit about, and I'm sorry, I'm not on the line, but can you talk a little bit about the state New Jersey, the lab, put this in the that when New York said no, that's... Well, there, um, if it were part of the pier, it was, wasn't a problem because it wasn't increasing the footprint. And we never got as far as the state DEC, DEP, or whatever it's called in New Jersey. Again, there was somebody there that I knew, and we had been talking a long time, and they seemed to be much more positive about something like this. So who you know is really important. Yes. Uh, being uh, somewhat autocratic, which you are not, would make things go a lot more smoothly. Right. That's uh, sad. <laughs> but we need autocrats again to make these things happen uh, more easily. And Neil, I'd like to build on that. I'm a graduate of Milano. And actually, several years ago, I took a, a class in Parks and Recreation. And I touted your pool project. and your goddess and uh, and that along with uh, the continuation of the greenery in New York City has been very important um, but because of the sort of the elimination of the middle class they certainly understand the need for pull projects in poor low-income communities like Brooklyn and the Bronx but the middle class is dwindling and it seems as though the city has made very special provisions for people like Donald Trump to build for Walt Disney and it seems as though, and then we have Chelsea Piers with juts out on the West Side Highway and, and into the river. I'm wondering how we can work with developers. And I know that Donald Trump, I think, was required to um, uh, help build Riverside Park South. But how do we work with developers in the city to insist that they include this type of project in the planning um, you know, for, for Donald Trump and those people so that it actually benefits the middle class, which is dwindling? And how then can we say that um, at the 79th Street Boat Basin, those folks should have boats there, which is Riverside Park, um, it's, it's, a, it's a park. Right. Why are they permitted to have houseboats there? And, and that serves a very small population. Why do we not have a large pool there that's installed um, to serve a greater community? So those are just some questions. Well, two things is the pool can't go on the west side because particularly within the west side park because that is a mm, environmentally protected area <laughs> and the, the the laws about that would be even more complicated the story about the um and Jeanette may know more about this or you know, parks department the 79th street boat basin that was a whole political thing All right, yeah exactly we sue the regular. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know the, uh, the, the, the latest waterfront uh, comprehensive plan for the waterfront? Mm -hmm. Take a look at that because I think that some of the answers to your questions would be in that. I think, I think Amanda Burden is very conscious of this. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much. Oh, this has really been a pleasure.